huge Hurricane Hugo. There he blows, whipping up extreme danger along the Atlantic coast, ready to take the southeast and later the northeast by storm. This is the CBS Evening News, Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. The hurricane has grown into a more powerful and deadlier Category 4 on a five-scale hurricane, and it's set to attack the southeastern United States overnight by air and by sea. The hurricane now packs killer winds of an estimated 135 miles an hour and a lot of water. It is the strongest and most dangerous storm since Hurricane Hazel in 1954. The hurricane also carries the potential for a, quote, lethal storm surge, meaning a devastating wall of water 12 to 15 feet high. The map reminds us of how far this hurricane has come from out over the Atlantic and how much it is fed on the energizing Atlantic Ocean waters. It's now estimated to be about 180 miles south of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Forward motion, 20 miles an hour, toward the northwest in the direction of the southeast U.S. mainland. Best bet computer projection has the eye or center of the storm making a Carolina crash possibly as early as midnight Eastern time a bad time because that's just before high tide. Most likely target, Myrtle Beach, possibly at high tide. That would dramatically increase the danger from a storm surge. Official hurricane warnings are up all along the coast from Florida's northern border through most of North Carolina. That means the hurricane is likely to strike somewhere within that area within the next 24 hours. Mass evacuations are underway throughout the hurricane warning area. That includes the coast of Georgia, of course. CBS News reporter Scott Pelley is there. Late this afternoon, Hurricane Hugo pushed a wave of evacuees onto highways leading out of Savannah, Georgia. An estimated 200,000 residents and tourists are seeking higher ground. This is a notice of evacuation. We're asking everyone, please be off the island by 3 o'clock this afternoon. The evacuation of the barrier islands began early this morning. Hugo is expected to hit during high tide, increasing the threat of severe flooding along the Georgia and South Carolina coasts. The island will be covered. We know that the road will be underwater and there's no way to get off the island once that road is covered. On the resort island of Hilton Head, roads were jammed with late evacuees. Here, 30,000 residents and tourists were ordered to leave. Worst problem is people are trying to get off the island and waited too long. We've been asked to evacuate. They're evacuating the nursing home and we're going to leave. On Tybee Island, just east of Savannah, residents of a nursing home were among 5,000 islanders packing up. 19th century homes and historic landmarks were closed just before electricity to the island was shut off. Despite the strengthening winds, some still refused to leave. Just another hurricane as far as I'm concerned. We might have a little water surge, but we've had water up to Butler Avenue before. Hurricane decoration. On the mainland, Savannah prepared for high winds and a possible flood along the historic waterfront. Some storm supplies ran out days ago. The last time a hurricane of this magnitude hit the Savannah area was about 100 years ago. Then, the island I'm standing on now was under 19 feet of water. The flood surge here tomorrow may reach that high again. Dan? Scott, other than a menacing sky behind you, it looks so quiet and peaceful there. Is anyone having trouble believing that the hurricane is going to be as bad as the Weather Bureau predicts? Well, this island, Tybee Island, is about 95% evacuated, but there are a few people who are hanging on. One man told us, a captain goes down with his ship, I'll go down with my house. Scott Pelley, thanks. Once the hurricane hits land, the big question is, what next? Computers at the National Hurricane Center now project that the hurricane may head inland, then track all the way up the east coast, passing near Cape Cod and out to sea by, say, Saturday morning. Keep in mind that while the hurricane's eye is over land, it will be losing a lot of power, the whole storm will. So if and when the hurricane does head north as expected, it may no longer be a full-fledged hurricane and the principal impact could, could be limited to a lot of rain and possibly some spin-off tornadoes. A few minutes ago, I spoke with Dr. Robert Sheets, director of the National Hurricane Center in Carl Gables, Florida. Dr. Sheets, this hurricane became much more dangerous today. It changed in character. Yes, as a matter of fact, it strengthened more than we had thought then and uh, not only the center part of the hurricane, but also out towards the northeast, and it's now a Category 4 hurricane that's near the top. Beyond above North Carolina, what can be expected? Well, as you spread on inland, here's the big problem along the coast here in the storm surge. It's going to be 12 to 17 feet above normal and coming in at high tide. And then as we move on up 
in this area, assuming it moves up the Appalachian chain, you're going to have all of those heavy rains, flash floods, uh, uh, situations that occur up there, probably some tornadoes or two. Bob Sheets, thanks very much. Thank you. Underscoring the hurricane's highest winds are now estimated to be at about 135 miles an hour and extremely dangerous, officially categorized as a four on a five-scale hurricane with a lot of water with it. To give you an idea of the force of these storms, look and listen to Hurricane Alicia. Alicia's winds were only about 115 miles an hour when it tore through Texas in 1983, blowing out windows, ripping off roofs, and knocking down trees. We just wanted you to see and hear the power of this kind of storm. In South Carolina this afternoon, the governor ordered an evacuation of coastal areas. Not everyone is complying. Reporter Aaron Hayes is on the scene in Charleston. The barrier islands here have already been conceded to Hugo, abandoned as it becomes clear the hurricane will hit. But some have refused a concession to Mother Nature. In historic Charleston, where homes have been battered by hurricanes before, there is a stubborn confidence that they can handle Hugo. Norma Riles isn't budging. I don't know, maybe I'm a strong person. I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'm really not scared. I love this house, and I ain't gonna move out of it for nobody. Not even for her daughter, who will now stay and ride out Hugo, too. We're going to stay here because, of course, Mom and Daddy will not leave this house. And what we'll do is probably just move upstairs. Gloria Dees is equally stubborn. If you leave, you might not have nothing to come in. But the wind and the waves crashing in already are a signal Hugo may be bringing more than those here can outlast. Charleston's mayor has been begging people to forego a fight with Hugo. Nobody has been through a storm like this. Nobody living in Charleston, in Charleston, has seen a storm like this in their lifetime, if we have a direct hit. Plenty are convinced that's true. The thousands who jammed the highways leading out of town this morning, leaving behind boarded up homes, sealed up businesses, final messages. As time to prepare slips away, officials hope their message is clear. You must be off the island by 12 noon. As Hugo approaches, there are last-ditch efforts to get everyone and everything that can be moved to safety. And that had better happen soon, Dan. That's what emergency officials are telling us. Already the rain is starting to pick up, the skies are much darker, clouds are right overhead, and the winds are beginning to pick up. Gale force winds are expected here after nightfall, and we're told anyone who's here after that had better just decide to settle in for the storm. Stan? First faint edge is already beginning to move in. Erin, there's generally a, a, an eerie feeling that settles over an area just before a big hurricane. Has that happened there yet? Yes, you know, this morning, Dan, it was so calm, so beautiful, and so peaceful right at dawn, and people were playing along the battery, along the waterfront, saying it's so difficult to believe that a hurricane's going to move in. Well, that. The scene dramatically changed later today. You saw people really in a hurry to get out of here. An eerie stillness, but not that peaceful calm we saw at dawn. Aaron Hayes and the Weather Bureau says they'd better believe. About 75 miles up coast from Charleston is Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where the hurricane is projected to make landfall overnight. CBS News correspondent Frank Courier is in Myrtle Beach. Frank? Dan, there's that same eerie sense of danger here on the deserted streets of downtown Myrtle Beach. It is dinner hour. There is nearly, there's no one on the streets at all, an occasional fire truck or a tow truck. What people here seem to fear most is a repeat of that Hurricane Hazel, the killer storm that struck the coast uh, just north of here back in 1954. The 110 mile an hour wind slammed the coast right at high tide. And of course, if that scenario repeats tonight, they're talking locally here about preparing for a storm surge of up to 19 feet. Now, that would be a good 12 feet above what is normally high tide along the Myrtle Beach coast. Dan? Thanks, Frank. The hurricane warning area stretches along most of the Carolina coast as well as the Georgia coast and some of the upper Florida coast. Correspondent Mark Phillips is on the scene 65 miles up from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, in Wilmington, North Carolina. Dan, I'm standing here on the Coast Guard dock in Wilmington, North Carolina, standing here in front of the Cape Fear River, very aptly named on this evening. The tidal range on this river normally runs in the five-foot range with a storm surge of 10 or 15 feet on top of that. Where I'm standing could well be under a good deal of water, perhaps another five or 10 feet above my head. 
Behind me is a street called Water Street. One of the Coast Guard seamen around here said that is a very aptly named street for this part of the world at a time like this. Dan? Thanks, Mark. High winds, high tides, flash splitting, all very dangerous. We've been talking a lot about something else called the storm surge. That's because it is possibly the biggest threat from any hurricane, accounting for nine out of ten hurricane deaths over the years. The storm surge is formed at the center or eye of a hurricane. This is a cross-section drawing. Low pressure in the eye draws the ocean water upward, forming that huge wall of water. As the hurricane approaches the coast, waves as high as eight feet start pounding the shore. Then, as the eye hits land, the storm surge roars in like a giant bulldozer, maybe 15 feet high. In the worst cases, this happens at high tide, adding three or four feet to that wall of water. If Hurricane Hugo does indeed hit the east coast at high tide, it could cause an even greater amount of destruction. Now, still to come on tonight's CBS Evening News, hurricane expert Neil Frank on his view of the danger and the track of this storm. Juan Vasquez in St. Croix, where the hurricane was only the beginning of big trouble. And James Hattori on a school bus that went underwater in Texas. A witness to the tragedy in Texas today said they were just trapped. James Hattori reports on the deaths of 19 school students. At least 65 school children were trapped this morning when a bus plunged more than 40 feet into a water-filled gravel pit in the Texas Rio Grande Valley. Rescue crews in boats worked frantically. Most of the bus was submerged. Divers had to go down 12 feet to pull out survivors and the dead trapped inside. We were pulling uh, the children out of the bus. Did you pull anyone out alive? No, sir. How many did you pull out dead? Myself, about six, seven. He was I don't know. The accident happened around 7.30 this morning in the small town of Alton. The bus, having picked up its last student, was headed for Mission Junior and Senior High School. Our truck was coming from the south and the brakes failed and hit, hit the bus. The bus shot into the uh -huh. pond. Parents in this mostly Hispanic neighborhood rushed to the scene. Authorities began to compile a list of students. For this family, some good news. Their child is at the hospital. For others, the news was devastating. At a community center, school officials tried to pass on the latest information and calm family and friends of the victims, all of whom were 12 to 18 years old. School district officials have canceled weekend extracurricular activities, mourning the worst school bus accident in Texas history. James Hattori, CBS News, Dallas. Investigators tonight are still trying to learn exactly why the pilot of a U.S. Air jet sought permission to abort takeoff from New York last night. What followed was death and terror. Gary Reeves reports. Tonight, investigators are trying to find out why U.S. Air Flight 5050 crashed into New York's East River on takeoff. Early on, passengers knew something was wrong. When he ever did get really off the ground, when he was... About the time you'd expect him to take it off the ground, he cut back on the engines. He put on the brakes. As he was putting on the brakes, we took a dip, and the next thing I know, all, he all hell broke loose. Two women on board were killed, pinned in their seats at the point where the fuselage cracked open. Nine other people were critically injured. The rest of the 63 passengers and crew on the Charlotte-bound Boeing 737 were pulled from the water, suffering only minor injuries. One survivor was CBS News producer David Hawthorne, who reported from the scene by mobile phone while waiting to be rescued. Uh, I was able to get up and uh, grab a couple of people and start going towards the back. Uh, a lot of women and children were actually screaming that they couldn't swim, they couldn't swim. Authorities are crediting the low death toll in part to the wooden trestle off the end of the runway. It's designed to hold the runway approach lights. In this case, it held up the nose of the airplane out of the water 35 feet deep. Investigators are looking closely at the plane's engines. Earlier this year, the FAA issued an emergency order for 737s equipped with similar GE engines that experienced problems flying in the rain. The aircraft was well maintained and was uh, fit and airworthy. The plane, in fact, was just nine months old. Flight recorders arrived in Washington this afternoon where they will be examined for details of what went wrong here and why. Gary Reeves, CBS News, New York. In 
some of the other news of the day. In Washington, Soviet Foreign Minister Shevardnadze met with President Bush at the White House. They agreed in principle to a Bush-Gorbachev summit, no date set yet, and they discussed U.S.-Soviet arms control proposals. Shevardnadze next holds two days of talks with Secretary of State Baker at a wilderness lodge in Wyoming. All this comes just one day after Mikhail Gorbachev engineered the ouster of several old-line communist opponents in his ruling Politburo at home. An overnight bombing wave in Bogota, believed to be part of the terror campaign by Colombia's drug thugs. In all, ten bombs exploded all around the Colombian capital, targets nine offices of Colombia's two major political parties and a bank. At least two people were injured. A ruling today in a divorce case that could set precedent in the high-tech, highly emotional field of in vitro fertilization. A judge in Tennessee declared that life begins at conception. He then awarded custody of seven frozen embryos to Mary Sue Davis, who says she hopes to carry them to term. The judge denied custody to her estranged husband, who said he didn't want to be the father. The eggs were fertilized and frozen last year before the marriage broke up. In the U.S. Virgin Islands, the first U.S. Army troops arrived on St. Croix today to stop the looting and other law-breaking in the wake of Hurricane Hugo. Juan Vasquez is covering the St. Croix chaos. Most of the soldiers who began arriving this morning are military policemen whose job is to stop the looting and restore government control. They are under orders not to use force unless necessary. You must understand, under, I'm under restraint that our people, we don't arrest civilians and we don't shoot civilians, unless, of course, we're going to be endangered ourselves. The biggest fear involves prisoners who escaped or walked away from the island's maximum security facility. Today, officials said there may be 200 at large. The Justice Department dispatched U.S. Marshals and a team of 70 FBI agents to help track them down. The residents of St. Croix are overjoyed to see the soldiers from the mainland. But the looting has stopped not because of their arrival, but because there's almost nothing left to steal. If they would have come uh, even Tuesday morning or Monday evening, we would have saved everything. This would have been saved, you know. Today, a couple of National Guardsmen were posted at this ravaged shopping center, but all the stores are empty now. Even so, a few stragglers came around. The island's residents are surprised that their neighbors were so violent. I've heard of people just going into people's houses and telling them to leave if they want to live. And uh, me, I myself was shot at one time. And it was panic time. It was panic time. There were roving gangs of people in the streets, chains, just taking what they wanted. That's why tourists trapped on the island were so happy to see the Coast Guard arrive last night. We need Marines here. We need martial law right now. We can't wait anymore. For them and for other tourists, the nightmare is ending. For the residents, the question is whether to start rebuilding shattered St. Croix or leave with them. Juan Vasquez, CBS News, St. Croix. The Commerce Department today reported the nation's economy grew at an annual rate of 2.5% from April to June. That's down slightly from an earlier estimate, but analysts insist it still meets the administration's goal of moderate growth with low inflation. be a special hurricane edition of 48 hours tonight at 8 eastern time on this station. CBS News will be tracking the hurricane throughout the evening as the eye of the storm moves inland. A reminder now of where we are at the moment with this hurricane. It's about 180 miles south of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. The eye or center expected to hit Myrtle Beach as early as midnight eastern time this evening. The hurricane is officially a category four packing very powerful and dangerous winds, estimated to be about 135 miles an hour, and this hurricane has a lot of water. It is the strongest storm to threaten the East Coast in 35 years. Once the hurricane hits land, the early projections are that it will head inland, probably losing a good deal of its strength, but still causing a lot of trouble, and then track up the East Coast to New England and possibly into Canada before finally heading out to sea. Joining us now is CBS News consultant, uh, Dr. Neil Frank, who's at our affiliate KHOU in Houston. Dr. Frank, what's the most important thing we need to know right now? Well, Dan, there's a combination of a number of bad events with this storm today. You've already indicated that the winds increased today up to 135 miles an hour. That means it's a Category 4 hurricane on our Sapper-Simpson 
hurricane scale. That also means that the water, the storm surge, is going to be several feet higher than we had originally indicated. So it might be 15, maybe even 17 feet above normal. And it looks like the center is going to cross the coastline pretty close to high tide. And if it does that, then that adds another three or four feet. So we got a very serious hurricane moving onto the coastline tonight, the most powerful hurricane to move onto the South Carolina coast this century. You know, Hurricane Hazel in 1954, the center of it actually moved over into the North Carolina area, even though Myrtle Beach got a very bad brush with that storm. So we got a bad storm moving onto the coast tonight, and I certainly trust that the people got off those islands this afternoon. Now, up above North Carolina, what can the country in the Northeast look for? Yes. Well, as the storm moves on inland, it'll lose its hurricane force winds very rapidly as the uh, center moves on up into the mid-Atlantic states, Virginia, and then on maybe off. It could even go out over the open water temporarily, then back into New England. The main concern is going to be the possibility of heavy rains. Now, the storm is probably going to move fast enough that we won't ex see extreme rains. But 5 to 10 inches of rain, I think, would be something that would be quite common as the storm moves on to the northeast. Dr. Neil Frank, talk to you later on 48 Hours. That's tonight's CBS Evening News. We'll have more coverage of the hurricane throughout the evening on this CBS station, including that special hurricane edition of 48 Hours that begins at 8, 7 Central Time. And throughout the evening, we'll keep you posted on the storm. So stay with us. For now, Dan Rather. See you later. be like. Go into the eye of the storm as it nears the U.S. coast. 48 hours live tonight. This is CBS. Last night I had this nightmare that there were no weekends.